Man, this is awesome. This is awesome. So I'm Tom Hastings. I'm going to talk about some security. That have, oh, is the audio on? Mic check. How about now? I can just yell really loud, really loud. All right. Where are my security practitioners or my DevOps folks that, this, that like a little bit like specialize in security? Who doesn't want to touch security at all? They're like, now nah, we got like a whole security team. They take care of us. We don't want to touch that, right? Because it, security just makes our life more painful. Well, that's good. I'm glad that I don't have a lot of hardcore security people in here because they might throw something at me. I'm coming at this from a developer, right? Less security, less painful security is better. Um, but I'm going to talk about what happens when traditional security actually sets you up to fail, especially when we start talking about um, supply chain, supply chain security. But a little bit about me before I hop into that. Tom Hastings, I'm a native here to Colorado. Got any natives? Natives? There's a few. There's a few. Mostly transplants. OK. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. It's beautiful here. I understand why you came here um, from wherever you came from. I'm a dad to five daughters. Dad to five daughters keeps me busy. Yeah, thank you. I think my hair is starting to gray, but it hasn't started to fall out yet. My oldest is 13. My youngest is two. They keep me on my toes. Um, but when I'm not hanging out with them, I am teaching classes at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Um, and I also teach at the United States Air Force Academy. I teach computer science there. And then when I'm not teaching or hanging out with my daughters, I work my regular job, which is the director of infrastructure for a smallish startup. We're about 100 people now called OneBrief. I just recently made that switch from being like that senior tech lead, sort of principal architect, into more of a direct manager. So if any of you are looking at doing that, I know it's separate from my talk, but I'd love to chat with you, like making that, that, that change from like that individual contributor part to being a director where now you're responsible for nine people and three different teams. Holy cow. Holy cow. All right. It, it's not all bad, though. It's not all bad. You can actually make more of an impact when you're working with people than you are with your DevOps stack. Um, keep that in mind. Cool. So introduction, supply chain attacks. Raise your hands because I think we've all heard of some supply chain attacks in the news recently, right? Like it's become a thing. And it's unfortunate because it's starting to hit our open source software. Open source software traditionally hadn't necessarily been targeted the way that it is now. And we're starting to see more and more advanced attacks that occur over years. They're no longer like onesie twosie sorts of things like a developer gets hacked and their GitHub repo gets compromised and code gets pushed up that's now malicious. No, it's maintainers come in and they're super helpful and they're supportive and they're there for years and they earn trust with the current maintainers. And then the current maintainers are like, man, I'm burned out. Why don't you take it over? And they're like, heck yeah, I'll take it over. And they, and they insert malicious code, what we call source poisoning, right? So, it, we're heading towards a, a, very, a very interesting time. You know, as Jason mentioned, the landscape is changing for us in DevOps. And it's not just changing to the, to the nature of moving to AI and ML, although that, that is a thing, right, and, and like virtual reality, but also security as it becomes more prominent, especially as they're trying to push security left within the DevOps world. So I got to tell you, the appreciation I have now being a director and trying to hire unicorns like all of you Holy cow, because not only are you responsible for helping developers get their code out the door, or maybe you are the developer trying to get the code out the door, like that's, as if that's not hard enough, now you got to be like a whole IT shop, right? We're looking for people that can QA, we're looking for people that can code, we're looking for people that can do operations, people that can write, write infrastructure as code, right? People that can maintain things, go on call, 24 hour ops, right? Like crazy, crazy. So we're going to add yet another thing to your, to your tool belt, right? And that's security. So now. You're, now, you're, now you're responsible for that as well. So security, um, excuse me, open source is used in a lot of places. 90% of software now utilizes open source. And I assume that number is probably going to go up as developers start gravitating towards tools like ChatGPT uh, and Gemini, right? Because those tools are trained on open source software. And let me tell you, it's, it's not going away. I thought it was a fad. I tried to use like ChatGPT when it first came out, totally useless. Fast forward two years. Wow, way more efficient, way more efficient. So we'll keep an eye on that. But at the same time, it's only going to increase what we call the attack surface for our code. There's a group of researchers from Microsoft a couple years ago that went
How about now? All right. That's what I get for trying to put my hands in my pockets. <laughs> All right. All right, so a group of researchers from Microsoft came out and they started looking. Well, they, they didn't start. You all know that, that Microsoft owns NPM, right? Did you all know that? That NPM? Yep. so Microsoft's got unparalleled access to, the, to NPM, which is what? Package Manager for Node.js. And they started looking at, at the packages and they're like, hey, there are some vulnerabilities, six types that are fairly common out there. Three of them, I'm like, eh, but for sure, Expired maintainer domains is a big one. And a lot of people are getting in to maintainer accounts using expired domain names. How could this be? Well, I've got my own custom domain name, tom at hastings.dev. And I maintain an open source project. Fast forward 10 years, I'm like, man, I'm tired of paying for this domain name. And I let it expire. But yet I still use it for GitHub, right? That's how I log in. Malicious actor comes along, says, hey, Tom's got access to a lot of these packages. Oh look, he's got a custom domain name. Oh look, his domain expired three years ago. Oof, so what do they do? What do you think? They go register it, right? And they're like, hey, I'm gonna create a new email address, tom at hastings.dev, and I'm gonna go to GitHub. I'm gonna say I forgot my password. And where does that password reset go? To that email account, right? Oof, and now they've got access to GitHub. Luckily, GitHub has started uh, implementing two-factor authentication, so it makes it a little bit harder to conduct attacks like this, but that's relatively new, within like the last nine months that that's a requirement for GitHub um, accounts uh, to have two-factor. Uh, another big piece, and we'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, I think that we've got a talk talking about the XZUtils attack that happened with Matthew, um, but there's installation scripts now. Like you pull down a package and you like run it and it does something for you, but hey, by the way, it's also going out to the internet to like some .ru domain name. Anybody know what .ru is? It's Russia, for those that don't know. And it's pulling down malicious code from some Russian server. Holy cow, and it's getting run every time you build your software. So not only is it on your dev box, but now it's in your CI CD pipeline servers that are running those. And eventually it could end up in production, right? If you're not paying attention, oof, right? Not, not a good place to be. And then the third one that I really wanted to talk about are these unmaintained packages. And these are packages that have been written there's a tool we'll talk about here in a minute called Node IPC, Node Interprocess Communication. Interprocess communication doesn't change a whole lot. It doesn't change a whole lot. Once you've written it, like very rarely do you have to go back and touch it. And we'll talk about a maintainer that went through and added some malicious code to his own repo and a dependency that never really gets touched. All right, so, so security, much more important these days, especially as more people are targeting the open source ecosystem. So not only are there people actively targeting things, but software's got bugs in it, right? Like, that just happens. Inherently, there are bugs. GitHub's got over 5,000 open source security vulnerabilities. Very interesting that they're reporting this. They've also partnered with a company called MITRE. MITRE operates a CVE database. CVD, CVEs are known vulnerabilities. Known vulnerabilities. GitHub is now a provider of these CVEs. So a, de a developer can go to GitHub and say, hey, I'm a bounty hunter. I found this problem with this open source package. I think it's critical. You should dub it critical. And MITRE through GitHub will look at it and be like, yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? They'll make the delineation. And then they'll, they'll put out a CVE on it. And these CVEs are how the rest of the community gets notified of vulnerabilities. And, and they're ranked like critical, high, medium, and low. Uh, but that's becoming a problem now for open source maintainers. Because open source maintainers, just like us in DevOps, we're already doing like six different jobs. Now the maintainers have to be aware. And I'm like, it, it's, not, it's not unreasonable to ask them to be aware of the security like issues with their software. But what we're seeing is there's been an uptick in nefarious reports or people kind of making stuff up or they're, they're making legit claims about the software, but it's in like the software's dev dependencies that don't actually reach production, right? So, it might be a legit claim, but it's not applicable. And now the maintainers are having to defend themselves against these CVEs, which is leading to more maintainers wanting to take a back seat with their software and take a back seat with maintaining their code and opening up the door now for more people, more, more malicious actors to come in and essentially poison their packages because they're getting burnt out. Because they're getting burnt out. Cool. And for software engineers, how many of you evaluate your open source packages? You're like, man, I wish there was a way to indent my code five pixels from the left. Would that be a thing? 
Would that be a thing? It, oh, it was, it was a thing. For those that don't know, you can go Google this. You can go read about LeftPad that took down like 80% of the internet um, because there's a dependency in there that would indent your text just a little bit. But a lot of developers that I work with, they're, they're in like a hurry up, right? Like we want, we want value to our customers. We want to go quick. And what are they doing? They're going out to, to, to Google, GitHub. They're like, crap, I need this feature and I need it now. How can I do this? Now even more so, they're going to a place like ChatGPT and Gemini, and they're uploading the company's like proprietary code up there, and then they're like, hey, fix this problem for me, right? So, so even more security issues and things that we have to be aware of. But we've made it so easy to bring in packages, right? And open source adoption is so high that we're bringing in a bunch of these vulnerabilities and companies are just not aware. And they're not aware because securing the, like the, the software pipeline is difficult. It's not easy to do. You can go after the code, you can go after the dependencies, you can go, um, you can go after like the actual build process itself, or you can go after the package management, like never mind the whole CI process. I'm just gonna hack your NPM account or your PyPy account or your RubyGems account. I'm gonna upload my own binary, right? Totally bypass the whole GitHub CI CD pipeline. I'm just gonna put up there whatever I want, right? Lots of things to protect against. So you as a developer, you as a DevOps engineer, when you're building your code and you're going through your infrastructure as code, or you're trying to build like that next feature, how are you evaluating that package that you just pulled in? Like some people go out and they're like, hey, um, they're like, hey, maybe, maybe the package has been updated in like the last, I don't know, year. Right, like they go to GitHub, they check that. Does anybody have a more thorough way of evaluating your open source packages other than checking you know, if they've been evaluated or like updated within like the last year? Current Artifactory. <laughs> we use X-Ray. We use X-Ray with Artifactory. We use X-Ray with Artifactory. Okay, that's good. That's good. Some, some organizations, especially where I work within government tech, highly regulated, right? So there's more emphasis put on it. Uh, but it used to be, right, and like this is where the traditional security comes in, especially in the government space, is like, hey, there's a new software update. What should you do? <laughs> should update. Duh. Hey, there's a new update. Newer is always better. Go update. So you would patch on Friday to avoid a breach on Monday. Patch on Friday to avoid a breach on Monday. And now organizations are patching on Friday, and they're breached on Monday. <laughs> Ooh, how is that possible? Well, they're pulling in dependencies that have been compromised or poisoned. All right, so let's talk about one of those. And this is the node IPC. And this was very interesting because the first time I've ever heard of a term protestware. Protestware. So this came from the maintainer. Um, is the maintainer of node IPC wrote another package called Peace Not War. And Peace Not War would target Russian computers based on their location of their IP address. And on, that, on their computers, it started off like relatively peaceful, right? Like he would, he would drop like a text file on there and say like, with love from America. You know, like, hey, like we're not real thrilled with what you're doing in Ukraine. Um, but then it became more serious and he got to a point where he, he tried to destroy files within these Russian computers. Um, very interesting. Node IPC is used by a bunch of packages, but specifically it was Vue.js. So there was a, a, the development team of Vue.js said, hey, we're seeing some weird stuff when I use Vue.js on my Russian laptop. Like, why is this happening? What is going on? Um, and they're like, well, it came from this dependency that came from this dependency. And they're like, oh, Node IPC must have been hacked. And they're like, no, no, it wasn't hacked. That's the maintainer. That was the maintainer doing it themselves, right? And what's very interesting is he even put out an update, like in the readme, like the release notes, that he did this. Um, you're like, huh, that's interesting. Node IPC, the other piece that of Node IPC, right, it's, it's a package that isn't updated very often, so a lot of people missed it. A lot of people missed it. So one key takeaway that we learned when we were looking at evaluating packages is a lot of people will go through to create an SBOM, Software Bill of Materials, like, hey, this is the sausage that we use to make the product. Um, and they look at the dependencies of the packages. But what they miss out on is looking at the dependents. Like, hey, I want to use this package, but let's see who else is using this package. Oh, look, Node IPC is used by like 800,000 packages and a bunch of other people. So it kind of it got me thinking back to when my parents would talk to me. And I, I'd hang out with some goofy friends. Some of my goofy friends would do goofy stuff. And they'd be like, Tom, if all your friends went and jumped off that bridge, you know, would you do it? Would you do it too? 
I'm like, well, as long as I wasn't the first or second, hopefully I'd realize that it was a bad idea, right? It's kind of like that same mentality with, with dependencies now, right? Like maybe you can look at the dependence. The more dependence the package has, the more eyes on that package, right? And the more likely it's going to get caught if there's some weird stuff going on. Another one, more recent, was top.gg. I had not heard of top.gg, but this is more for my gamer friends from the Discord community. This is a website that hosts a bunch of Discord bots, um, and they were compromised. And they were compromised by hackers that started compromising PyPy packages back in 2022. So they've been at this a while. And it was kind of like this, hey, we got A, we got B, and then we captured C. And they started out using what we call typo squatting, um, or dependency confusion, where they created a repo, and the hackers did, created a, ha a repo called pypyhosted.org, instead of pythonhosted.org. And they put up some legit packages on there. They also modified some of these packages to be nefarious, right? They were malicious packages. Um, and it was through this that a maintainer from TopGG pulled down a, a dependency that they didn't mean to get. Um, like it had the same name, same version number, but it came from a, from a bad website. Um, and when they pulled that down, the attackers were able to mine the data on their computer for their GitHub credentials, and they were able to get access into the supply chain, and they poisoned the Python SDK for top.gg for these Discord bots, which impacted the community of over 170,000 members, right? But it's been slow moving. These people have been waiting and wait, really, like for many years, for many years before they carry out these attacks. So they're becoming more sophisticated. So what we really got to start asking ourselves as DevOps people, as software engineers, as operations people, is this build versus buy question. Build versus buy. It used to be really easy to say, hey, we'll go, we'll go buy. Like open source software is free like a puppy, right? Like we'll go buy this software and we'll use it. But now with the amount of vulnerabilities we're seeing and the amount of active malicious actors out in the wild, it needs to be a, a question that we really start to ask ourselves. Like, hey, we need this feature, it's very simple. Should we write it ourselves, or should we go out to the internet? A few years ago, I was going through an interview with SpaceX to, to work on their SRE team. Great company, I still regret not flying out for their final interview um, to actually go see their facilities. But as I was going through the interview process with them, I was like, so, what's your DevOps pipeline look like? What's CI look like? Do you guys use Jenkins? And the dude on the phone started cracking up. He's like, no, we don't use Jenkins. I was like, oh, do you have like, oh gosh, what's it like? Are you using like GitLab runners? Like how, how are you doing this stuff? He's like, no, no, we don't have any of that. I was like, how about Artifactory? Like this, he's like, no, no, we build everything ourselves. I was like, wow, really? Okay, that's interesting. But when you think about the criticality of the software that they're writing, I guess it makes sense, right? It makes sense. So for companies and organizations that work in highly contested, and highly regulated environments, it might be time to really consider pulling in that open source package. And I know I'm not gonna make any friends by saying that, right? Because it's gonna be more work on the teams, but you know what you got. In order to offset for those, those teams that don't wanna build their own software or 100% of their own software, um, NIST, who's heard of NIST? Anybody heard of NIST? All right, so this is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, came out with this framework called RMF. Bad word, bad word. I cringe every time I hear it. But the framework is really good. It's this risk management framework where you monitor, you assess, and you respond. And at the center of that is framing, right? Or in security, we call that education. You need to kind of frame the problem so you can do these steps. So I'm gonna walk through a quick framework with you that you can use if you decide to use open source software. Um, there's a couple of key security, I don't know, terms, lingo, that, that security folks love to use. Zero trust, who's heard of zero trust? A couple of people. I always feel bad when I say zero trust because what you're saying is you don't trust your employees, right? We have zero trust. We don't trust anybody, don't feel bad, but we don't trust you either. We should not trust our maintainers or the software that we're pulling in from the internet, right? That's, that's where we have it. The other piece of that is defense in depth. Defense in depth means you have more than one check in place for your software, you're not just checking Hey, was it updated within six months ago? Well, yeah, it was updated six months ago by a jerk who put malicious code in there. Like, okay, doesn't really protect you, right? And the third piece is assume, assume breach. And this is where software practitioners 
have the biggest problem I found, is assume your stuff is going to get hacked. Not a matter of if, but when. Not a matter of if, but when. And a lot of tools we have right now are on protecting like that happening. But we really need to be taking a look at if it happens, when it happens, how does the community respond, and how are we going to respond with our software itself? And you can do that, kind of taking more like the software development lifecycle from the cloud and applying it to the software development lifecycle of your dependencies. So day zero, day zero, you've, you've done that build versus buy um, trade-off analysis, and you've decided, hey, we're going to go with an open source component. OK, great. Now what are you going to do? Well, there's a lot of known knowns you can find out. We'll talk about those here in a minute. Day one is like, OK, we've we, we went through the known knowns, we understand the package, we understand the, the community makeup, and we've decided to deploy the package. Cool, now it's in prod. What happens when it's in prod? Well, that back door executes, right? And all the bad stuff happens. Day two, what happens after that? You've initially deployed to prod, it's now been running for three months. And now it starts foaming home to that RU domain name. Right, how would you know? How would you know it's going to do that? So you need to understand the known knowns, the known unknowns, and there's going to be the unknown unknowns. And how do you protect against all of these things? So day zero, day zero, selecting the package. You can check for vulnerabilities. That's where X-Ray comes in. Who said X-Ray with, with Artifactory, right? You can check. There's lots of places to go for CVEs. You can do status code, static code analysis on the, so on the code itself, right? That's the whole point of open source software is where you've got the source code. So let's check it for known weaknesses in the code. Um, you can check its dependence. You can check the community. Um, and you can understand the hygiene of a package. Has anybody heard the term hygiene of a package or package hygiene? A little bit, a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about hygiene of a package. There's a really cool tool out there called Scorecards. It came from Google originally. It's now um, maintained by the Open Source Security Foundation, or Open SSF. These scorecards are neat. They capture 16 heur heur heuristics from open source packages using a tool like GitHub. And not only does it look at the package for vulnerabilities from its dependencies or inside the code itself with CVEs, but it takes a look at like the makeup of the maintainers. There's a thing called the elephant factor. The elephant factor is how many companies are contributing to this open source software. The idea being that the more companies that are, that are participating with this open source project, Hopefully you get a little bit um, better SLA, right? There's, there's really no SLA, but maybe you get a little bit better support with them. It can also identify branch protection, meaning that not any Joe Schmo can push directly to your main branch, right? Like there needs to be some kind of review that takes place, and maybe you need to have three or four maintainers give the thumbs up or approve the pull request before it can be merged. You can also sign releases now, sign releases now using um, certificates, right? So that can be you saying, yes, this is me signing this commit, and my account has not been hacked. Um, let's see, what else I want to talk about on here? Just a couple of things to look at. Unfortunately, with these scorecards, though, they're really looking at it through the lens of, is this package vulnerable? And like I just assume every package is vulnerable, though. But this is some good information that you can take with you as you move forward to the day one piece, right? Which is introducing the package. And this is really where I don't make friends with software engineers. Where I'm like, hey, if you really want to know when something changes, you can pull in the package and use it, but you should start building it yourself. Don't throw anything at me. That's OK. I know, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. The burden is heavy. You're like, bro, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of using open source tools, right? Like, we don't want to build it ourselves. Like, OK, I get that. I get that. At the very least, make sure you're pulling the package from a known place, right? And like this is where a tool like Artifactory would come in, where you can where you can proxy from known repos and it stops your developers from fat fingering or typoing uh, like a Python package registry and downloading stuff. And also when new software gets released, you can go through and look at like the pull request. So you're like, hey, I've been using this version, it went from version 1.5 to version 1.6. Because we've all got infinite amount of time, right? You can all go to like GitHub and like look at the pull request. I mean, you could. It depends on the criticality, right, of the environment that you're working in. So not great, not great. Pretty heavy stuff, um, but there are things that you can do. And then day two is very interesting. And this is where, do I got any network DevOps folks in here? 
people that enjoy doing the networking, this is where you come in. Like, hey, there's this really cool thing that I saw it at a previous employer, and it's where they terminate the SSLs at the boundary of our company network. So everything that's, that's going on inside of the network is done in the clear, which some people are like, wow, that seems sketchy, right? But it's inside of your infrastructure. Maybe it's not so bad. But this allows you to monitor the network traffic going across like VPCs in AWS. Um, so if you've got network boundaries set up around your development environment and your production environment, you can start essentially packet, packet sniffing all of the data that's going across those environments to see if there's weird stuff going on. And it's a very interesting now with machine learning how routers and switches have been able to, to learn, like, hey, I've been operating in this environment for six months and this traffic looks good, and then all of a sudden that .ru domain pops up. I was like, I think that's sketchy. That's sus, right? We're going to block that. We're going to block that. So it's going to take a holistic approach as we, as we move forward, right? And I think a lot of that emphasis is going to be put on our DevOps engineers to kind of bring everybody to the table to really understand the security landscape and the threats as they evolve. The last piece of that RMF framework is framing the risk. And no security talk is complete without talking about education. Because education is like one of the biggest parts of security. You know, I can talk to you until I'm blue in the face, but it just takes one of you to click on some link, right? Now our whole network's compromised, so don't, don't go click on any weird links, all right? Um, but you got to frame the risk. And a lot of software engineers, and I teach at the college level, they're not teaching software engineers about the risks of open source components. They're not, right? Like they're teaching, like they, they might get a class where they have to do like a team project and build some kind of like SaaS application or maybe some LLM. But nobody's telling these developers about the risk of going out to Stack Overflow or going out to Google and just pulling packages in. That's going to be the job of, of the employer, unfortunately. Um, so we really need to make sure that developers understand this. And for those of us that have been around a while, it's something we take for granted. We're like, oh yeah, everybody knows that, right? Well, well, maybe not. Maybe not, right? And so it's understanding some of these different types of attacks that are occurring on open source software. And like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that with maintainer burnout on uh, tomorrow with Matthew when we talk about the, the latest and greatest breaking supply chain attack. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you don't want to get stuck holding the bag. You don't. Your company doesn't, right? If a package gets, um, gets poisoned, you need to understand that the maintainers are going to take care of it for you. And if they're not, I hope you got a plan B. hope you got a plan B. Otherwise, you might be building that software yourself. Cool. Really consider the build versus buy. Evaluate packages prior to bringing them into your environment. And monitor packages in the wild. Um, you're like, OK, how can I monitor packages in the wild? Well, you can follow the repos. That can be time consuming and cumbersome. Right? You can create Google alerts. I don't know if anybody's gone through like, the, the process of creating alerts. You can set like keywords in Google. You're like, hey, every day at like 5 PM, send me an email of things like, I don't know, I use Terraform a lot. So I get Terraform notifications for Terraform security. You can do stuff like that. The other piece, and security's sort of old school like this, is we still use mailing lists. We still use mailing lists. So you can go to like OpenWall. OpenWall is actually where that XZ utils that we'll talk about tomorrow, that's where it was first announced that there was a vulnerability with that XZ package, which is like critical to, to a lot of things that we do with inside of our open source packages. So a couple, of, a couple of ways to stay informed and stay up to date, because security is always changing. The threats are always evolving. I need to be aware of what's going on with your packages. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to me talk about open source security um, management and vulnerability detection. Again, I'm Tom Hastings. If you want to talk after this, uh, like an open space, I'd love to talk more about security. I just left Amazon, so if you want to talk about AWS, I'd love to do that. Or if you want to talk maybe a little bit more about moving into uh, like a director manager type role um, from an individual contributor piece, I'd love to talk about that as well. Thank you. Thank you.